Welcome to Scary Savannah and Beyond. This is going to be episode number 56, but it already feels like episode 115. I know, we've been trying to do this for a while. Turns out I cut myself while I was shaving, and there's blood all over my face. At least that's the story <laughs> we're going with, right? And I have something in my eye. Yes, it's and almost like something's trying to keep us from doing this particular yeah, episode. everything is just falling apart today. It's a horrible disaster. I had to get four shots in my mouth today to get a crown, so my mouth was all weird for hours, so we couldn't record. It's finally feeling better, and now there's something in my eye. Yes, and I had blood all over my face from a shaving incident. <laughs> Maybe we should just go to bed. I think we should just give up on this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening. This has been Scary Savannah and Beyond. Play the song. Here it goes. Bye. Just kidding. And we're back. We're back. So, Crystal, how have you been this week? I've been really busy. We had the annual Christmas tree lighting on Tybee. It was a little bit of a underwhelming event for well, me. There was a whole thing. There was a, a market, the first annual holiday market or something. So they yeah. got a bunch of vendors on Tabrisa and then you guys played music on the well, stage. Well, that part was fun. I meant the tree itself lighting up was a little well, underwhelming. You're definitely disappointed because it's not a real tree and it's only white lights. Well, the tree they used to have was phenomenal. I know. They had a real they tree. They used to get a real one every year. Right beside the crossover by the pier. And then for whatever reason, they decided to go to the artificial tree and I guess it's same just, reason I did, probably. Well, for them, it might be cost too, because to plant a new tree that big every year would probably be expensive. Yeah. So, I mean, it's easy just to have the tree pay for it once. Yeah. Light it up one time. Don't put any decorations or nothing on yeah, it. Yeah. They don't even, they used to, I think kids it. used to make um, ornaments and put on it back in the day. It was pretty interesting. It had turtles and stuff, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. And now it's just white lights on a tree. Kind of boring, but. You know, with an island like we live on that's very eclectic, you think they would yeah, create us to come together and create something. We have a Tybee Island Maritime Academy, which is for the kids, and that's where they go to school. And they used to decorate, I believe, is the way it, what it used to be. But and they'd have a little kids' choir. I think they did do that. They had stuff. kids dancing and stuff, but we left before we that. We got cold and left. Yeah, we A guy we had came out that. and started singing in Latin to children, thinking yeah. it would entertain them. I was like, this is not English. This isn't even a song they would like if it were in English. But we did have fake snow, which was fun. It was fun. And... Like you said earlier, my band actually, well, it's not really my band. It's just a bunch of me and my friends who happen to be in a band every once in a while. The funny joke that goes around about us is when we go play, everyone asks what our band name is, and it literally it's changes different. every single time. Yeah. I think this last show, we were the carburetors. Yeah, because the alternators didn't show up to play, so y'all were like <laughs> the we were backup. Like the backup. We're, we're the carburetors, not the <laughs> alternators. And then a lady came not up to be and told us with. another band name. Yeah. Confused with a, another thing that sounded like an or on the end, and I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> it was an embarrassing thing. Right? Nah, yeah, sure. We'll go by that name here for this yeah. uh, particular show. But here's a little clip of us playing music. That was exciting, wasn't it? That was it? exciting. Oh, yes. It was like two seconds of pure sonic and onslaught. They even had a cornhole tournament, and that was cool. All the locals were playing in it except for us. Yeah. I it think was like a $250 entry fee, though. I saw it? that. So, really? Yeah. Well, it's from teams, like from like Huckapoos and stuff. I think Huckapoos won. We should have done one for Scary Savannah and Beyond so that we would have lost, but we could have got Ethan <laughs> well, involved. Well, Ethan had played. And we could have got my brother Andrew to come down from North Carolina, and those two used to be pretty good yeah. at Cornhole. They almost beat the old men that live at that Ocean old people Lakes. reservation over there on Myrtle Beach, Ocean Lakes. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's what it is. That's what it's they a do campground. for a living. It's a campground. They throw Cornhole bags for a living. old people reservation. <laughs> well, it <laughs> seemed like it. <laughs> well, other news in Tybee, they are filming a movie over near Fort Pulaski. And yeah. it's called Eleven, and it's starring Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson. You mean Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson? Uh, this is not the Maryland episode. We're not pronouncing names. Maryland. Right. That's the last time I could say that before she gets really it mad. Is, it's Channing Tatum and Scarlett Johansson. And it's about the space race in the 1960s, I do believe. 
Uh, it's what you told me. I'm going to go with yes. It's what's written on the script, so that's what we're going with. Did you with. see one of the hotels over here? I did. I was going to tell you about that. The Royal Palms changed it to Holiday Inn. It's got like an old the sign. The old school sign. And it looks so cool. You know, I they're going to take it down it and throw it in so a dumpster. It was so annoying because it. they have the whole freaking road blocked off, and I had to go all the way around to go to my dentist appointment today. We should just go walk down there and take some pictures. Uh, yeah, I saw a friend of ours did get a picture by it. Did you see Holland? I didn't see Holland. I just saw somebody had posted a picture of yeah, the sign. Yeah, Holland was posting next Holland. to it. No, then it wasn't the picture I saw. But let's we should walk out there and go walk to the pier if they'll let us on to see it. Yeah, they've got the pier all done up like it's in the 1960s, like arcade something. I don't know. We saw pictures. Penny Arcade. Penny Arcade. Seafood Market. All that yeah. good stuff. One of the bar owners here that's one of our friends her name's jennifer she owns the bar that we play open mic night at a lot of times and she posted it earlier it says just saw scarlett johannison and Joe channing Hansen. tatum no big deal and i'm like i bet they didn't come in the bar yeah, they probably just drove by on a no, no 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 but did you see they snuck out there and got yelled at several times is what she said underneath that totally that. sounds yeah. like <laughs> she said we got yelled at like three times but it was totally worth it it was totally worth it what are they gonna do arrest them i know. That could be the first time anyone on this island's going to jail <laughs> yeah so i can't i'm actually excited to watch that when it comes out just because oh yeah it's about space I it like might that. even deal with the subjects we talked about yeah it might mm-hmm. what did we talk about <laughs> well we talked about uh it was an mk ultra but we did do the moon hoax yeah, you did that one. That one was good. You don't even remember that one because I, I wrote it. I vaguely remember it. Uh huh. So we in never, the sense that it exists. Yeah, I remember that it exists and that it was in black and white. Ah, see, I, did I watch didn't watch it. I didn't remember that. And see, I, did it. I watched it. <laughs> this week we're covering a low country true crime case. Unlike most of our stories, this one is current and is still playing out. But so much has happened so far that I wanted to go ahead and cover it, even though the trial of the man at the center of it all hasn't happened yet. As of right now, the trial is scheduled for January of 2023, so we'll revisit this once that happens. But it's such a fascinating story, I wanted to go ahead and talk about it. And while writing this, I realized there's so much information that it really could be a multi-part episode. Each one of these victim stories could easily take up an entire episode of their own, but I did try to condense it down and give it an overall view. Yeah, I could tell that this story was very exhaustive because over the course of the last past several days, I go sit on the couch beside her in the living room to admire our Christmas tree and decorations, <laughs> which grow every single day. I still got stuff coming in, by the way. And we sit there and she talks to me for a long time. And it's like she never runs out of material about this case. And the more and more you hear about it, you're like, every single aspect of this case from the prosecution tutorial side and the defense side is ridiculously crazy yeah it is crazy and you may have been able to tune me out but now you have to listen i didn't tune you out <laughs> you can give me a quiz let's see how much of it i remember after you divulge it with the uh, listeners of course okay by no means is this an exhaustive account because it's impossible to convey all the intricacies of this case if our listeners are interested then we can do more stories on the subject in the future focusing on one thing at a time so please give us your feedback if you want us to do more on this case or if you're not into it and you want us to stick with our scary stories and yeah. all that. So just let us we know. We are a true crime podcast, too. And if you could go to our website, go to our contact page and send us a message or leave yeah. us a voicemail and just let us know what you think about this case. Or if you happen to have any additional information, because uh, a lot of our listeners are from around this area mm -hmm. and this actually takes place not that far from us. So let's get into it. For those of you that don't know, we live in Georgia very close to the South Carolina line. We can see it. As soon as you cross over the Talmadge Bridge in Savannah, you're in South Carolina. Now you're going to say it right. South Kakalaki. I never say it that way, and neither do you, except when you're trying to be like your dad. Or your pawpaw. Yes, he would say it that way. Yes. This story takes place in a small South Carolina town called Hampton. Hampton is a rural community with less than 3,000 people covering just four and a half miles, so epitome of a small town. It's not really much bigger than Tybee, then, No, is it's it? small. Well, it's part of a bigger, you know, Hampton's a small city, I mean, but the they're in city Hampton. population yeah. and size. Yeah, the actual city of Hampton's small. The residents are described as genuine and friendly. Hampton is known for its annual watermelon festival, hence the watermelons on their town sign. 
That's a dead giveaway. There are watermelon eating contests and, of course, a parade. And you won't ever see me at that. <laughs> no. This event has been an annual tradition in Hampton since 1939. Unfortunately, Hampton has become famous for something less wholesome than watermelons. It's the home of accused murderer Alec Murdoch. Before we get too far into this, I want to clarify pronunciations. It's important. In the South, we often pronounce words and names differently than they're spelled, such as we have a place nearby called, it's spelled Whitefield, but we pronounce it Whitfield. We do. There's all kinds of instances of this. And then there's cities like Buford and Beaufort. Yeah. And it's spelled the same, and they're different cities. Yeah, and then. I think it's spelled the same. Cherryville, we say Cherville. Cherville. Yeah. It's a single syllable. Yeah. Five syllable word. <laughs> in Hampton County, where these events occur, they have a particular way of pronouncing things. And the main subject of the story is a man named Alec Murdoch. And they pronounce it Alec or Alec Murdoch or Murdoch, even though his first Murdoch. name. Yeah, they say it different ways. And his name is spelled A L E X, like mm. Alex, but they pronounce it. And he pronounces it himself as Alec or Alec. As you know, it's like Alec. It's yeah. just the way, the draw that people have. And here's proof. You all know Alec Murdoch. I just don't want anyone thinking that we're pronouncing his name wrong repeatedly because this is how they say it. So that's how we're going to say it. This isn't me writing a script where every name is pronounced wrong by accident. This is somebody who has spent hours of research well, on the I've, subject. I've listened to so many podcasts and watched so many things and read so many articles. And I hear people say it all different ways. But yeah. the people from Hampton... Call him Alec or Alec. Mm -hmm. No one calls him Alex there, really. Even his family. So and we'll go with what the family say. Yeah. And I also want to say that no one has been convicted of these crimes that we're about to talk about yet, so we want to presume innocence until they're proven guilty in a court of law. Actually, one person has just been convicted in the past several days, and we'll touch on that later, but Alec has not had his day in court. So he's innocent for the time being. Yes. We have to presume so. I do. <laughs> this story has so many twists and turns involving five mysterious deaths and financial discrepancies and secrets that need unraveling that I struggled with even where to start. But I decided to start with an event that occurred on February 24th, 2019. I feel like this event is the catalyst that caused the whole world of Alec Murdoch and his dynasty to start to crumble. This event was a boat crash that claimed the life of 19-year-old college student Mallory Beach. The boat in question was owned by Alec and his son Paul, who was 19 at the time, was driving the boat. Paul, along with five other friends, had taken the boat out, and all of them were consuming alcohol underage. Never a good idea. Sounds like a bad mix. Yeah. Paul purchased beer from a local convenience store named Parker's using his older brother Buster's ID. You know about Parker's. We got about 150 of those in every square mile around here. We do, and that is a story in and of itself, as they're involved in a lawsuit oh with my this, goodness. in this case as well. That could be an entire episode. I've listened to so much on that, too. So on the boat ride home, they stopped at a bar where Paul consumed more alcohol. Despite protests from the others on board, Paul continued to drive the boat. His friends say his personality would change when he was intoxicated, causing him to become angry and erratic. They even had a second name for him. They called him something else, like a completely different name because he wasn't like himself. Mad Dog. I can't remember what it was, but I know they had a name for him. The other passengers on the boat were arguing with him and telling him he didn't need to be driving, but he wouldn't listen, and as a result, he hit a pylon of a bridge on Archer's Creek near Paris Island, traveling at 29 miles per hour, according to the GPS records. That's pretty fast on a boat. That is sure. really fast on a boat. I'm going to say that like I have any idea what knots and miles per hour and everything are. Well, you don't think of it being that vehicle. fast in a car, but on water, that's really fast. That's going faster than one in big container ships do. Well, for sure. 19-year-old Mallory Beach and her boyfriend, Anthony Cook, along with Paul Murdoch, were thrown into the water. Paul and Anthony resurfaced, but Mallory did not. Oh, no. Police and emergency responders attended to the survivors and searched for Mallory. Unfortunately, her body was found eight days later. In the chaos, police dash cams recorded a furious Anthony Cook confronting Paul Murdoch, who didn't seem phased by the gravity of the situation. And here's a clip of Anthony talking with a police officer. What y'all put in that? She just yelling. She just had to recall, was it? The only island on she just. Yeah. 
Do y'all know Alec Murdoch? Oh, yeah, I know that name. That's his son. Good luck. So the reason he's reacting this way, saying good luck, is because he knows who Paul Murdoch is. He knows the Murdoch family and how powerful they are, and he's doubtful that Paul will be held accountable for his actions. Paul's blood alcohol level that night was 0.24, which is three times over the legal limit. That's a lot of alcohol. That is. While the surviving teams are in the hospital being treated, hospital staff report that Alec Murdoch and his father were going from room to room talking to the kids. Okay. This photo is from the HBO documentary, and that's called Low Country, The Murdoch Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And this footage has never been released previously. HBO had this exclusively. Oh. And it's a controversy in and of itself. But Were they sitting on it right until this case is happening intentionally, you think? Well, it was a lawyer for one of the survivors on the boat that actually had this footage. And he had thought, he says, he thought that it had already been released due to a Freedom of Information Act request, but it had not. So he released it to HBO. Uh huh. I'm sure yeah, so there's as a purely. I want to get to the bottom of this kind of gesture, yeah, there's not any be, kind of monetary compensation. Yeah, there's going to be repercussions of that, I'm sure. But here you can see that's Alec in the white shirt. Okay. And that's Paul in the blue in front. And that's, Oh, he does look young. Yeah, he was 19 here. And that in the back is his father, Randolph Murdoch. Okay. And so you see what they're doing. They're going through the rooms, apparently. Oh, so this is them actually going yes. room to room. This had not been seen before. They have actual footage of him walking in the rooms. Did they claim they didn't do this? Well, I don't know. Or was it just not like even something anyone thought of? And this guy's like, hey, they're going around talking to these people, obviously, to try to influence testimonies, I'm assuming. Yes, that, that does happen. And this is what Connor Cook is saying. Okay. In testimony from Connor Cook, who is Anthony's cousin, who was also on the boat, he states that Alex told him to, quote, keep his mouth shut and to inform law enforcement he did not know who was driving the boat at the time of the crash. Mm. So he's trying to intimidate them, it seems. I'm sure he's had similar conversations. And all these people, I'm assuming this man has a reputation in the area and people know of his influence and power. Oh, I'm not saying learn more about this. I'm not saying he's necessarily threatening people. I'm not saying that, but no. I, I'm assuming his presence there probably carries some weight. Yeah, he's the kind of person that walks into a room and takes over the situation and does things and makes things happen, and people fall in line, usually. The following month, Mallory Beach's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit, and Paul Murdoch was arrested and charged with causing serious bodily injury and voting while intoxicated, causing death. He entered a plea of not guilty. He was released two months later on a $50,000 bond. Let's talk a little bit about who the Murdochs are. Alec Murdoch's father and grandfather and great-grandfather were very powerful members of the community. You know when they take pictures like this? Yeah, they're somebody. They're somebody. Yeah. Like the guys that used to own the company I work for now, yeah. they had a row of pictures along the wall. Of yeah. each one of them going back to the 1800s. Yeah. And every single one of them looked exactly like this picture. This is early 1900s here. Spanning 87 years, they all held the title of Solicitor of the 14th Circuit, which is in essence the role of district attorney. Sounds important. This is one of the highest titles in the local judiciary system, covering five counties. And you can see the counties, Allendale, Hampton, Jasper, Beaufort, and Colleton. Okay. So that entire area is where they're influential. That's covering a lot of ground. In the early 1900s, Alec Murdoch's great-grandfather founded a law firm called PMPED, which stands for Peters, Murdoch, Parker, Eltsroth, and Dietrich. That just rolls right off the top. Yeah, PMPED is a little easier to say. It's like the third time she's tried to say this. <laughs> the firm specialized in wrongful deaths, medical malpractice, that sort of thing. They had a reputation for getting large settlements for their clients, and they were the go-to law firm if you were involved in an accident. The power of the Murdoch family was far-reaching and unchecked. There's a story involving Randolph Murdoch II, who was nicknamed Buster. I oh, just like his grandson. grandson. Yeah, they use that name a lot. They all have red hair, and they're all they all use the name Randy Randolph. Randy Randolph Buster. Yeah, Mad Buster. Dog. <laughs> Well, uh, That's Alec, conjecture. Alec has a nickname, too. He's called Big Red. We'll talk about that. This is Alec Murdoch's grandfather. 
The story goes that Randolph the second son got into some trouble and Randolph, this is Buster, called up a prominent lawyer friend of his and told him that his son was in some sort of trouble and he needed his help to get him out of it. This lawyer readily agreed to help him out, and within the hour, the matter was settled. Well, apparently, he knew people. Yeah. Buster called him up the next day and asked him what he owed him, and the lawyer said, Nothing, it's a favor. Nothing's ever a favor. Buster allegedly thanked him and said, If you ever need to kill a man, come to Hampton. There it is. Yeah, so we don't know if this is true or not, but this is what goes around Hampton. Yeah, we're not accusing anybody of murdering or getting in there and being an accessory to murder, but we're just saying. It's the kind of town where everybody knows everything, but no one's going to say anything because they don't want to be the one to say anything. And it's not just that they might be scared of retribution. It's just that's sort of the code, you know. You don't rat on people. Well, they are afraid of retribution. Well, I mean, obviously, <laughs> but I'm saying You'll that's another out. thing here is like that's the way a lot of people around here are, too. Mm -hmm. The Murdochs enjoyed the good life. Alec, whose nickname was Big Red because of his red hair. I was hoping you were going to say he wore a big red hat, just like <laughs> the man from the Curious George, except in red. No, and I think his his dad, Randolph, they call him... Um, Bigger Red? No, they call him Handsome. Oh, Grandpa Handsome. Red. Grandpa Handsome because he wasn't very handsome or something. I think that's the way it went. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so Alec met his wife, Margaret, or Maggie, as she was known, while they were both in college at the University of South Carolina. They married in 1993 and had two children, Buster in 1996 and Paul in 1999. They enjoyed expensive trips, beautiful homes, and were avid hunters. As a lot of people in the South are. Mm -hmm. Alec Murdoch worked for the family law firm PMPED. Pimp. I thought that's what I, you know, I was like, that's what that looks like. You knew like. I was going to say that. I know you were going to say that. So. They owned several properties, including a 1,700 acre estate called Moselle, complete with a hunting lodge. That sounds pretentious. It is. This is where we will talk about the next two deaths. This is June 7th, 2021. Paul is out on bond still, awaiting his trial in the lawsuit brought by Mallory Beach's family. He is 22 years old at this point. The lawsuit also involves Alec, since he was the owner of the boat, and Buster, because his ID was used to purchase the alcohol. The lawsuit is going to require revelations of their financial records. They are due in court in just three days. Uh -oh. And then this happens. Now we won't wait for emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just stopped badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? <laughs> sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Hurry. Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Con County Communication. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. So on the surface, this sounds like a distraught man who has come upon the bodies of his wife and son, but there's more to this double homicide. The true nature of Alec will slowly become evident in the following months. Maggie was killed with a rifle and Paul was shot with a shotgun, and the initial time of death window is between 9 and 9.30 p.m. The 911 call placed by Alec Murdoch took place at 10.06 p.m. Now pay attention because these time frames are important. Yeah, that I is important. I know that from you telling me yeah, earlier. This was what was initially thought. And window is currently from 9 to 9.30 p.m. And there were two guns used in this thing. In a shotgun this and a rifle. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's not uncommon for them to have guns. They have lots of guns on the property, so that wouldn't be unusual for there to be guns there. It would be weird that two different guns were used because it seems like if there is, say, one person coming in to commit murders, they wouldn't carry two weapons in. Or is that what they want you to think? That's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. It's like either it was more than one person mm -hmm. with two different weapons, you know, one per person, or you had to have one person come in with two guns. Right. But why would you? To make people think it was more than one person. Ah. And the particular way that that shotgun was loaded 
was a common way that the Murdochs loaded their um, shotguns. Did they pack their own shells yes. or something? Yeah, the way they pack the shells. I know some people do that. Yeah, I've heard that. I'm not real familiar with it, but buckshot and they put something else in it. They mixed it, and it wasn't just the common way that everyone else does it. So that was key, as it's going to come up later. We know lots of people that know lots about guns. We should have brought in an expert. <laughs> we should bring in a gun. If we do more, we'll get a gun expert. We know some. Yeah, because it's just a whole lot to even go into the gunshot. But yeah. there, suffice to say, there are two guns in this, and it could be. Okay, so at this point, the window is from 9 to 9.30. Mm-hmm. There are two guns involved in a double homicide. There this are. is what we know right now. That is. Just three days later, on June 10th, 2021, Randolph Murdoch III, Alex's father, dies at age 81 due to various health complications. And this doesn't have anything, like he didn't have anything to do with the homicides, but he was part of the alibi originally, which we'll talk about in a second. In the days following, on June 25th, 2021, Alec and his son offered a reward of $100,000. This is a quote from Alec Murdoch. I want to thank everyone for the incredible love and support that we have received over the last few weeks. Now is the time to bring justice for Maggie and Paul. Buster and I, along with Maggie's mother, father, and our entire family, ask that anyone with helpful information should immediately call the SLED tip line or Crime Stoppers. And SLED is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, and they are investigating this case. Okay. So if you hear us refer to SLED, that is what we're talking about. All right. And this certainly seems like a normal thing for a family to do and say, except strangely, at the bottom of this reward offer, there is an expiration date of September 31st, 2021. Why would you put an expiration exactly. date on a reward? You had for, have so if somebody to, gets back to you on October 1st. You don't want to know. I yeah. don't, you don't. At this don't point, it. It, uh, it runs out. Yeah, I have never heard of a reward having an expiration date. That's just weird. If you're willing to offer this money, and if you're so desperate to find out who has committed this atrocity, why are you doing You Are you thinking that's going to like expedite the process maybe. and maybe that's be, the only be like, thing well, I've got to get of. this info in? You know? that, that's a good point. That's the only thing I could think of, but I've never heard of that before. Yeah. The Murdoch family, including Alex's brothers, went on Good Morning America and revealed that Paul had been receiving threatening emails that began soon after the boat crash. They hadn't taken it very seriously, and so these murders were a big shock for them. This is Alex's older brother, Randy. My brother loved Maggie and loved Paul like nothing else on this earth, just like he loves Buster. So there's no possible way he could have had anything to do with this, I can assure you. In this interview that was just 10 days after the double murder, so we're on June 17th now, Alex's brothers John Marvin and Randy said that on the day of the murder, Alec had taken their very ill father, Randolph III, to the hospital in Savannah. So you can see that's quite a distance to drive. Yeah, why would they go to Savannah? Well, I think that's the hospital he did end up going to, but they're saying that Alec took him there, but that is not what happened. We find out much later on. Okay. But this seemed to give Alec an airtight alibi for a while. Maybe that's why he said he went to Savannah or why he chose to go to Savannah is because there's no possible way if you're going that far away, yeah. You could be somewhere else. We'll come back to the alibi and the time of death later, but this is what came out initially. His brother, John Marvin, went on Good Morning America and said that. We're going to circle back to these murders, but like I said, this case has many twists and turns, and this is one of them. In the investigation into Maggie and Paul's brutal murders, evidence was discovered that led sled. Remember, that's the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. How could I forget? <laughs> it led them to reopen a case from 2015. This case was opened on June 22, 2021, so just 15 days after the murders. This was an unsolved death of a 19-year-old openly gay man named Stephen Smith. It is not yet known what evidence they uncovered, but whatever it was was enough to look into his death. Stephen Smith was found on the side of Sandy Run Road about 4 a.m., about a mile from his car, with blunt force trauma injuries to his head, including a broken skull. His death was initially ruled a hit and run, despite the fact that there was no debris and no serious injuries to his lower body. His shoes were still on his feet, which is unusual when a body is hit by a vehicle. 
It seems their shoes are almost always knocked off. I thought that that was like a movie trope. That is not. That's real. That's real. Mm. They say that happens almost every time. And they have a picture of his shoes that we're going to post here if I can get it. And they're very loosely tied. Okay. So they would have come off. Yeah, they would have come off. Likely would have come off. Yeah. They were like adamant that they should have come off. The rumor through Hampton is that Stephen had some sort of connection to Alec Murdoch's older son, Buster, who he went to school with, and it was feared their connection would get out. In a small southern town, being openly gay is still very much unaccepted. The lawyer for the family, his name is Mike Hemlip, he believes without a doubt that this death is directly related to his sexual orientation. Whether that involves the Murdoch family or how it connects is still unclear as the evidence has not been released at this point. South Carolina is one of only two states remaining that have no hate crime laws on the books. What's the other one? I think it's Wyoming. Okay, I wouldn't have guessed that. I know, isn't that crazy though? I would have thought something like Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy Smith, who is Stephen's mother, describes her son, who has a twin sister, as a bubbly person who would always light up a room and brighten your mood. Sandy stated that while she was on the phone with Stephen's father, upon learning the news of her son's death, Stephen's father told her that he was getting a call from Randy Murdaugh, who we talked about is Alex's older brother. Yeah. He told Sandy that Randy was offering to take on Stephen's case pro bono. And this is while the like it just happened. Pro bono means free, right? It does. Okay. So she's just finding out. She just calls because she's not with the father anymore. Mm-hmm. And... She calls there to check on her son because she heard there was a body found. So she's talking to him on the phone. And while she is, this is right when it happened, he's getting a call from Randy Murdoch. Okay. And she found this very odd since it was supposed to be a hit and run and there was really no case at this point. Yeah. And she also stated that she was driving by the crime scene and she saw both Randy and Alec standing out there. Now, what are they doing out there? Why would they be there? Exactly. Randy has claimed that he didn't know about Stephen's death until after the funeral, and his law firm claims that he never offered them legal services. So clearly something fishy is going on here. Somebody's lying yeah, to somebody. She's adamant that she or drove by and lying. saw them standing there, and they deny it. The family of Stephen Smith has not filed any lawsuits against the Murdochs in this case because they don't have any proof at this time. Their lawyer is adamant that someone in Hampton knows what happened to Stephen and is hopeful they will come forward. It's likely those who do know are reluctant to speak up because they know the Murdoch name and fear the repercussions of talking. Here's a clip where an investigator from the South Carolina Highway Patrol is speaking. You know, a lot of people seem a little nervous to say the name Murdoch. Uh, Yeah, and, and, you know, I I understand that they're uh, pretty big down there in Hampton. But um, I'm out of Charleston, and that name doesn't mean anything to me. So I, I want you to feel, you know, like you don't have anything to worry about. So, you know, it's clear that locals are hesitant to speak about the Murdoch name. And this guy being out of Charleston, he Apparently doesn't, doesn't care. He doesn't care. So he wants the truth. Sandy just wants justice for her son. It's been seven years with no answers. Hopefully the continued investigation will yield answers as this case continues to unfold. Let's get back to the murders of Paul and Maggie. As of September of 2021, three months after the crime, there are still no charges or arrests. But on September 3rd, 2021, Alex Murdoch resigns from the law firm PMPED. The very next day, September 4th, 2021, another 911 call comes in. This sounds fishy before you even tell me what this call was about. Hampton County 911, what is your emergency? On um, Sarkahatchee Road. Okay, what's the address on Sarkahatchee Road? I'm by the church. Uh, what church? Uh, here? What church are you talking about? Uh, I don't know the name of it with the red roof. Okay, what end of Sarkahatchee Road? Because I don't know what you're talking about. Um, at the Hampton County side. Okay, what's going on? I st- I got a flat tire. Mm-hmm. And I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes. But okay. I mean, I'm okay. You shot where? Where were you shot at? Huh? Did they actually shoot you or they tried to shoot you? They shot me. But 
Okay, wait, you need EMS? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I, I can't drive. Okay. I'm and I'm bleeding a lot. Where, where part of your body? Uh, I'm not sure, it's somewhere on my head. So, this is Alec Murdoch claiming that he was shot in the head by an unknown assailant. How could a man be so unlucky for all this to happen in such a short time know. frame? Like, it really seems like someone has something out for the Murdochs. That's or what it seems is that like. what it's intended to look Or is that what I'm supposed to think? Exactly. Sled said in a statement at the time that he was shot. On Let me say it. On old Skalkahatchee. I don't know if that's right, but <laughs> right. if someone's going to butcher a word, it's going to be me. Near Varnville, South Carolina, he was transported to a hospital in Savannah, Georgia, for treatment of a superficial gunshot wound to the head. Superficial yes. gunshot wound to the head. How fortunate. Well, I mean, unfortunate. But if you're going to get shot in the head, the superficial way is the way to go. A spokesperson for the Murdoch family said, quote, Alec had an entry and exit wound. His skull was fractured, and it was not a self-inflicted bullet wound. Alec pulled over after seeing a low tire indicator light. A male driver in a blue pickup asked him if he had car troubles. As soon as Alec replied, he was shot, end quote. Hmm. That's the account that his family gave. Okay. But we'll come to find out later that his kind of, the vehicle he was driving, it had tires that won't go flat. So yeah, we're not really going to be able to get into that very much, but this whole story is not true. And that uh, his tires, he had a, actually had a vehicle that the tires don't go flat. I've okay. never heard of it, but apparently that's a thing. It's like, enough of a thing that apparently somebody found that implausible that yeah, that actually He wouldn't happened. be changing a flat tire on that vehicle that he had, but we're not going to go into that too much, but that's one thing he's lying about. Two days later, on September 6, 2021, Alec makes his public resignation announcement from PMPED and states that he will be entering rehab for a 20-year-long opioid addiction. Wow, this just keeps getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> right. How does a man have a 20-year-long opioid nobody knows. addiction? And nobody knows. And it's not like he's flipping burgers yeah. or, you know, out cutting grass. He's, he's a being a lawyer. So it seems like somebody would be, hey, there's something wrong with this guy. In a statement, Alec says, The murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I have made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that has been exacerbated by these murders. I am immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. I ask for prayers as I rehabilitate myself and my relationships. The very next day, on September 7th, 2021, there was an announcement from PMPED. Quote, His resignation came after the discovery by PMPED that Alec misappropriated funds in violation of PMPED standards and policies. A forensic accounting firm will be retained to conduct a thorough investigation. I'm uh, skipping town, y'all. So the timing of his resignation Peace. is uh, quite convenient and is entering rehab. So as he's walking yeah. out the door, here come federal agents <laughs> walking in the other door. <laughs> The firm said that it had contacted law enforcement and the South Carolina Bar. Now, mind you, we are not making any claims that we think that this guy did any of this <laughs> stuff. Because <laughs> no. we live so really close to this particular <laughs> region. So we're just reporting the facts as she sees them. Okay, so think about it. This is happening each day. Like it's the fourth like, bang, he was shot. Bang, bang. The fifth he resigned or whatever. The sixth. What was it? Yeah, okay, so what are the odds that all of this stuff could happen in such short order? Right. He got shot on the fourth, and then uh the sixth he gave his pus his public resignation. The seventh, the PMPED says the you know, there's an investigation. The very next day is September eighth, twenty twenty one. Alex's older brother, Randy, who also works at PMPED, stated that he was, quote, shocked to learn of his brother's quote settling of money, as well as, quote, drug addiction. He stated, quote, I love my law firm family and also love Alec as my brother. While I support him in his recovery, I do not support 
condone or excuse his conduct in stealing by manipulating his most trusted relationships. I will continue to pursue my client's interests with the highest degree of honesty and integrity, as I always have. End quote. How hard would that be if you're his brother and you're not doing anything wrong? Like, if you're not involved at all. That would be extremely Like, it difficult. tarnishes your name and your law firm's name. It's just a bad situation And you love your brother. Around. It's a really close family. I mean, it's just a whole mess. So, Alec Murdoch's law license is suspended by the Supreme Court. So surely nothing else happens like almost immediately hereafter. We'll right? find out. On September 13th, SLED confirmed that they are the law enforcement agency investigating the missing money from the law firm. So they're all over the place. They're doing everything. September 14th, 61-year-old Curtis Edward Smith is arrested by SLED for his connection in the shooting incident of Ellick from September 4th. His charges included assisted suicide, assault and battery of a high aggravated nature, pointing and presenting a firearm, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. Sounds like your former stepdad. Yeah, he might be involved. I wouldn't be surprised if he was in this. He just has his picture here, but he wouldn't be going by his real name because he had a bunch of aliases. (laughs) On September 15th, Alec Murdoch's two high-powered attorneys, Jim Griffin and Dick Harputlian, released a statement claiming that Alec enlisted Curtis Smith to shoot him and kill him while in a mentally ill, drug-addicted, and grieving state. You're really giving off the My Cousin Vinny vibes here. (laughs) In the statement, they said, quote, On September 4th, it became clear Alec believed that ending his life was his only option. Today, he knows that's not true. For the last 20 years, there have been many people feeding his addiction to opioids. During that time, these individuals took advantage of his addiction and his ability to pay substantial funds for illegal drugs. One of those individuals took advantage of his mental illness and agreed to take Alec's life by shooting him in the head. Fortunately, Alec was not killed by the gunshot wound. Alec is fully cooperating with SLED in their investigations into his shooting, opioid use, and the search to find the person or people responsible for the murder of his wife and son. Alec is not without fault, but he is just one of the many whose lives have been devastated by opioid addiction. Yeah, I think this is like classic spin doctor stuff like they're trying to use this. I because love that band. I did too. But you know how people, like if you have a drug addiction, people are less likely to put so much blame on you for what you're doing. It's almost like you can use it as an excuse for something. But speaking of the spin doctors, because you brought it up, I, you know, everybody knows I'm a musician. One time I posted myself playing a bass cover and the guy from the spin doctors the lead singer guy tweeted about it and said it was good. Wow, that is nice. That's impressive. That is now so tell me impressive. about this music, this non-music story we're talking about here. <laughs> that really happened. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like they're using that. I don't know if he has a drug addiction or not, but it's it could be an act. It's clearly a diversion, at the very least, to try to. So his he's saying. That he wanted to kill himself so his older son, Buster, could get his $10 million life insurance policy. But if he kills himself, you know, it negates the policy. He doesn't the get policy. the life insurance policy because so suicide that's why he hires the guy. It. That would be considered suicide, though. Not if, if they didn't know somebody, that you hired the guy. But if they figured it out. I guess he didn't think they'd figure it out. I just think the whole thing's fishy. Everything about this story's been fishy up to this point. So on this same day, September 15th, 2021, a lawsuit is filed against Alec Murdoch in regards to a death that occurred at Moselle, February 2018. So this is about a year before the boat crash. So this is the fifth death that's in this orbit of these fam- of this family. Okay. So I told you this case was crazy. This lawsuit was in regards to the Murdoch family's housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, who died after allegedly falling down the steps at Moselle. So we're going to play the 911 call of Gloria Satterfield. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, can you give me the address one more time? Make sure I got it right. Yes, 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, what's going on up there? I'm sorry? 
What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, you said she's fallen. She's bleeding from the head. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she saw some standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she out bed or inside? Outside. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not, like, responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Man, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way, and you asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know if she's responding really. at all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all. Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Um, is she breathing okay? Yes. Is she bleeding from anywhere? Yes, her head. Okay, are you guys able to control the bleeding? No. Can you I put a even clean tried. rag or anything on it? Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay, is she bleeding from, it. like, her face, the back of the head? I've got an neck. ambulance coming. Sir, my name what? Where exactly is she bleeding from on her head? I'm not sure, at the top of her head. Okay. What's so, okay. Oh, can, what happened? She, she just fell back down. Can I get off this phone so I can go down there? Can I have your name and phone number? Are you able to Maggie. bring the phone down by her? What? Are you on a cell phone where you can walk down there I'm and on talk? A cell phone. No. Okay, can you bring it with you so we can ask her some questions about what kind of pain she's having? Hello. Yeah. Can Can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having? Ma'am, she can't talk. Okay. Do you know? She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she bleeds out of her left ear. Okay. She's bleeding out of her ear. And out of her head. She's cracked her skull. Okay. All right. The other lady said that she had tried to stand up and fell down again. No, she. I was holding her up. And okay. She told me to turn her loose, and she was trying to use her arm, but then she fell back over. So in this call, you hear Maggie and Paul saying that Gloria fell down the stairs, and they don't know how exactly. Like they didn't see her fall. Yeah. But Alex said that he wasn't there when the accident occurred, but he arrived shortly thereafter, and according to Alex, Gloria was able to tell him that the dog stripped her. Okay. Gloria was taken to the hospital, but she died a few days later. Soon after her death, her two sons claim in their civil lawsuit that Ellick came to them and suggested that they sue his homeowner's insurance in order to get a settlement for themselves. Okay. So that's weird. That sounds like the whole rest (laughs) of the story. Murdoch introduced them to his friend, who was also a lawyer, named Corey Fleming, to be their representative in, quote, filing legal claims against Murdoch in the wrongful death of their mother, end quote. Gloria's sons say they never received any of the money from the settlement that was $505,000. Later, we find out that there was much more money in that settlement than just 500000 but when this suit was filed, that's what they believe they were due. So what I don't understand is if all this time goes on and you're never seeing any money, what do you... Why are you not approaching them? Maybe they were just pushing them off and saying, this is how government works. This is mm-hmm. how payments work. It just takes time. Yeah, you'll get it eventually. Hey, you'll it's it got to go through this department to that department to this department. And it's just, I'm sure they just gave them the runaround. Yeah. So, like I said, this is a lawsuit filed on September 15th. And on that same day, September 15th, SLED stated that they were going to open an investigation into Gloria Satterfield's death at the request of the Hampton County Coroner's Office in response to information that was coming out during the Alec Murdoch investigation. Gloria's death certificate stated that her cause of death was natural causes. How does falling down a flight of stairs natural causes? Exactly. This is suspicious because it was alleged that she fell, which would be an accidental death. To be clear, the family of Gloria Satterfield does not believe that the Murdochs had anything to do with her death. They do believe it was, in fact, an accident. But it's the fact that they never received the money that Alex allegedly misappropriated. That is an issue. You're talking about quite a large sum of money. Right. But it is weird about the cause of death. There was no autopsy performed or anything. So what caused them to say that? Just the fact that all this other stuff was going on. So they thought, well, this is kind of suspicious. Maybe we should look at it. Yeah. 
Yeah, they started looking to, into every aspect of his life at this point. Because if they looked into that and somehow found evidence of foul play, mm-hmm. then maybe they could use that going back to the other cases and say, well, if something happened here, yeah. then maybe it's a lot more likely he was involved with these other cases, mm-hmm. of which I'm not saying that he was involved in any of these three cases. Just to make that clear, everybody up there in South Carolina. Gloria was very close to the Murdoch family and was more than just a housekeeper for them. She loved both Paul and Buster and was there from the time they were little boys, even going on family vacations with them. Well, then they do sound like they were probably close. So maybe yeah. it was just an accident. I do believe it was an accident. Yeah. I don't, But it's the money scheme that's not maybe it's, an accident. Maybe it was a horrible accident, but then an opportunity yes, to he saw. Oh, money yeah. He saw an opportunity arose. right away. That's what it was. Because he, we'll find out, he's been doing this for a while. But she did have, like, some underlying medical issues. She wasn't in perfect health. So, I mean, she could have, like, gotten dizzy, you know, hot, low blood sugar or something, and fallen. It, yeah. it may have been the dogs, I don't know. But, like, she had complications in the hospital and things like that. So, yeah. I think her, her overall health condition could have been why they said natural causes. Mm-hmm. But it's still... They should have done an autopsy and such. I thought that they almost always did an autopsy unless it's like a very old person. Well, it depends on like, who you know. Yeah. But don't they typically do an autopsy? Not necessarily. I don't know how that works. I mean, All I know is an autopsy takes 10 minutes on a TV show. <laughs> well, we're going to hear more We're going to run later. this blood test and they walk out and they're like, well, what do you think, chief? Okay, here's the blood test. Yeah. It's not how it works. So the very next day, September 16th, 2021. Murdoch turns himself in to the Hampton County Detention Center. He was arrested in connection to the September 4th shooting incident in which he conspired with Curtis Edward Smith to assist him in committing suicide for the explicit purpose of allowing a beneficiary to collect life insurance, Sled said in a statement. Sled said that Alec provided a statement on September 13th admitting to the scheme for the purpose of his son collecting a life insurance policy valued at $10 million. A day later, Smith admitted to being present during the Murdoch shooting and disposing of the firearm afterward. Sounds like an open and shut case to me. The charges against Alec Murdoch were insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, along with filing a false police report. That's a... Sounds serious. <laughs> Sled Chief Mark Kill stated, quote... I can assure you that SLED agents will continue working to bring justice to anyone involved with any criminal act associated with these ongoing investigations. The arrests in this case are only the first step in that process. That's true. Also, on September 16th, Curtis Edward Smith made his court appearance where his bond was set at $55,000. His next hearing was set for October 25th. He got out of jail when the people bailed him out with a can of skull and six watermelons. Because that's what they're known for around them parts. I don't know if he was able to get out. On September 18th, 2021, Alec appeared in court and was given a $20,000 personal recognizance bond. He was to return to rehab, and Judge Tanya Alexander stipulated that if he were to leave the rehab facility, a bench warrant would be issued for his arrest. Oh, no, not a bench warrant. I don't know what that is. Is that a judge saying, hey, you're going to be arrested? Yeah. October 6th, the hits just keep on coming. PMPED, the law firm he resigned from, filed suit against him, alleging that he had taken money from client accounts and moved them into fake accounts and that this had been going on for the course over the course of many years. The response of Alec Murdoch's attorneys, quote, Alec holds every member of the Peters, Murdaugh, Parker, Eltroth, Detrick Law Firm in very high esteem, Griffin said on Twitter. He has pledged his full cooperation to the firm. And also in October 2021, Alec and Buster's assets are frozen by a South Carolina judge, which makes me wonder how he continues to pay if the man these high was attorneys. smart. And I'm assuming he was smart or is smart. All that money, there's going to be money in the banks here, but you know there's some place out in Bolivia. How's he getting to or it? In the He's Caribbean. in jail. He's probably got <laughs> people doing it for him. We'll Don't see. you know how? Haven't you ever seen a TV show? The main guy in the prison has flunkies 
They go do his business for him and run the business while he's behind bars. I'm not saying that's what Alex's doing. I just want to make that clear. On October 14th, 2021, Alec Murdoch was released from rehab in Florida and was promptly arrested by SLED. <laughs> and charged. As he walked out the door. <laughs> yeah, it Click. was. And charged with two counts of obtaining property under false pretenses. Now, that's a charge we've heard we quite a few times with that. from uh, your previously mentioned stepfather. stepfather. I can't call him that. These are felony charges. In a statement, SLED said, quote, These charges stem from a SLED investigation into misappropriated settlement funds in the death of Gloria Satterfield. His bond hearing was scheduled for the following day, October 15th. His lawyer's statement read, quote, Alec intends to fully cooperate with this investigation, as he has with the investigation into the murder of his wife and son. The Satterfield family claimed that after investigation, it was uncovered that Alec stole over $4.3 million from the insurance settlement related to the mother's accidental death. That is insanity. That is crazy. They thought it was half a million I bet they're not big fans of him anymore. Right. They called this arrest, quote, a very good start to holding everyone accountable. The lawyers for the Satterfield family released the following statement, quote, Avarice and betrayal of trust are at the heart of this matter. Since early September, the families are dealing with the betrayal of trust and that their loved one's death was used as a vehicle to enrich others over the clients. The reason the statement says families plural is that all these investigations reveal that Alec has been stealing money from not just the Satterfields, but many, many others as well. Allegedly. Yes, allegedly. Allegedly. Well, we'll find out he's admitted to at least the Satterfields. He's still innocent until proven <laughs> guilty. On October 15th, 2021, Dick Carpootlian, one of Alec's high powered attorneys, what a often lawyerly called, name. He's often called a bulldog. He went on Good Morning America and made the following statement about his client in regards to the September 4th alleged suicide for hire scheme. Quote, Those medical records show he was positive for opiates and barbiturates on the night that he was taken to the Savannah Hospital. He has a long-term Oxycontin opiate addiction that put him in a position where he did those stupid and illegal things. So he goes on Good Morning America and admits that the guy was high. Now, granted, yeah. he's done some stupid things, <laughs> but it's the opiates. It's crazy. You got to understand. It is so crazy. On October 19th, 2021, Murdoch is denied bail and ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. So he wraps up October. Surely nothing else could happen. Yeah, we're going to Come November. Come November. In November of 2021, Alan Wilson, who is the state... Alan Wilson? Yeah. <laughs> it's not the same Alan no. Wilson I'm thinking of. In November of 2021, Alan Wilson, who is the South Carolina Attorney General, announces that a Hampton County grand jury issued indictments for Alec Murdoch for conspiracy, false claim, or payment in the amount of $10,000 or more, and filing a false police report in connection to the apparent September suicide for hire attempt. Indictments were also issued for Curtis Edward Smith for pointing and presenting a firearm, conspiracy, assisted suicide, assault and battery of a high aggravated nature, and false claim or payment for an amount of $10,000 or more. Wow, that's a lot of words. Yeah. So this charges. time, let's summarize, there are 27 counts against Alec including four counts of breach of trust, seven counts of obtaining property under false pretenses, seven counts of money laundering, eight counts of computer crimes, and one count of forgery. And a partridge in a pear tree. Yeah, so he's got a lot of stuff going on. So in December, more charges are brought against Alec, adding on to the previous ones, more of those breach of trust, computer crimes, etc., and one count of forgery in an alleged scheme to defraud victims of more than $1.3 million. Or, you know, just like an average December for your average, you know, civilian person in the United States, as things go. Right now, at this point in December, they are alleging that he has embezzled more than $6.2 million. Well, that's less than $10 million. And these charges are going to continue to pile up. 
Well, I just said it's less than ten million, and then you have to go and say that January is a come. No, December. It's still December. December. 13th. It's not even halfway no. through December. Yeah. December thirteenth, Murdoch's bell is set at a whopping seven million dollars. Seven million dollars. From jail in Richmond County, Alec gives his first public statement in months. My head is on straighter. I'm thinking clearer than I have in a long, long time. I want to deal with these charges appropriately and head on. Murdoch is unable to make bail. All right, peace, y'all. I find that hard to believe that somebody can't come up with $7 million. I mean, just $7 million. You only have to come million. up with part of it, I'm sure. I mean, he got more than half of that just from one <laughs> place that he allegedly defrauded. In late December, Alec agrees to pay $4.3 million in the settlement to the Satterfields in their wrongful death lawsuit. And I'm not sure where he's supposed to come up with this money since his assets are frozen. He'll write him an IOU. I'll write you a check. <laughs> you know, that's as good as money. You might want to hold on to that one, you know, yeah. like crayon written on a hamburger wrapper. I wonder if they, I think they've gotten some money. Well, I hope well, so. Well, I hope they did. I think they have. Um, they need to. I'm sure that was uh, as traumatic as losing their mom was. The fact that they got defrauded out of not just the 500000 that they assumed millions. that they were yeah. entitled to when they see it was millions of dollars, which $500,000 to the average person would be a phenomenally life-changing amount of the money. The median income for these people in Hampton is $30,000. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean for us, that would be life-changing Oh, for money. sure. I'm but, just saying, like, these are but, poor people who trusted the, you know, that this that man was friend. a friend and, and a, you know— that's going to help them. And, you know, they were betrayed. Yeah. But then you talk about a life-changing sum of money versus a unimaginable yeah, sum of like money. that's like generational money changing for it them. It really is. Yeah. Probably not so much to him because he was a multimillionaire, and I'm sure that's still a lot of money, but it isn't quite the same as somebody who maybe has to work in a whole different world yeah. than a lawyer works. Yeah. In January of 2022, more and more charges pile up with revelations that he allegedly stole money from a highway patrolman who was injured in an accident, as well as a quadriplegic man, in addition to Gloria Satterfield's sons. Allegedly stole money from a quadriplegic man. Yes, it was a young man named Hakeem, and he was deaf to begin with, and him and his mother and I think his cousin were involved in a car accident. The tire ex blew up. And yeah. she lost control, and it left him a quadriplegic. So he was already deaf, and then he was quadriplegic on top of that. And Alec, you know, was going to be his lawyer, and I think he brought in Take Corey care Fleming. Of everything. Yeah. Well, it didn't end up. He didn't end up getting the money, and he ended up dying before the suit was settled. It's a whole lot of well, stuff. That's terrible. Yeah, that's a whole story in and of itself. But his crime stated all the way back to 2011. His new total charges are 71, and it's alleged that he stole $8.5 million. This is January. Is he going to hit 10 before Not you know, quite. February? January 24th, 2022, Mallory Beach's family file a claim against the estates of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. Two of these survivors also join the Beach family's legal claim in an attempt to get money they believe they are owed as a result of the accident. So they're trying to go after... Maggie and Paul's estate. Okay. Because Alec probably has no money left. May 4th, 2022, four more chargers are announced. These are more financial crimes that include Corey Fleming. Remember that lawyer friend of his who was supposed to help the Satterfields? Yeah. Well, he was allegedly involved in other crimes as well. It's kind of a scheme they had going. On June 3rd, 2022, it was announced that Gloria Satterfield's body would be exhumed and an autopsy would be performed after questions were raised around the circumstances of her death, including that manner of death we talked about earlier, saying she died of natural causes. Yeah. Initially, there was no autopsy performed, like I said. And they're saying it can take some time for these results to be, you know, released. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I found that really interesting. That was this past June that they are, they are going to perform an autopsy from the lady. It happened in 2018. They could still get viable information from oh, a body that's that, can. that, this, that oh, old. Oh, yeah. I've seen them dig up bodies from like 1979 and find something. Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. Oh, they, I mean, remember um, 
Ann Jett Lyles, didn't they exhume her husband? To or find mother? traces of poison. Yeah. Because at first they thought he died of natural causes. Well, and when the other people like started dying. Finding dive, traces of a poison might be easier than looking at a body to determine the. Well, I guess they. Well, I I've think seen they so want, many things where they can see the injuries and determine. Well, they're going to try to determine a cause of death because it wasn't a natural cause. So they're going to see uh, like trauma so to her head because she was falling down the stairs. She was bleeding she's... from her head. They said she hit her head. So they're going to confirm that, I assume. But it might not have been because of falling downstairs, I guess. It could be. It could have been any kind of blunt force trauma, right? Well, from what I've heard, Paul was asleep and so was Maggie when it happened. Yeah. She was coming over to pick up a check. I don't remember which one of them woke up, but one of them went to the door and then she fell and then they called the other one out. So I don't think anything that they had anything to do with it. But I think it's just suspicious that it says natural causes. That's the yeah. problem. On June 28, 2022, both Alec Murdoch and Curtis Smith are indicted with criminal conspiracy and narcotics offenses. So he's just getting into even more, not just money, it ain't, uh, the not hits just keep murder, on humming. even drugs. Humming. Yeah, drugs. What more could go wrong? Smith is also indicted on other drug charges. The accusations are that Alec and Curtis conspired to purchase and distribute oxycodone in Colleton County from October 2013 to September 2021. So it seems like these two men had been had dealings in the past. I also read that they are distant cousins and that Alec had represented him previously in a personal injury case. So Okay. He's saying he didn't know him beforehand. It was a perfect stranger that came up and shot him in the head, but he knew this guy. Wow, he's just a nonstop barrage of getting One thing caught after another. and lies yeah. and all these things going down. This is almost unbelievable. It is crazy. So also in June, new indictments claim Murdoch was involved in an alleged drug trafficking ring. Because why not? So this just keeps going. You just, I can't believe all the stuff that happens. Later that month, Wilson, who's the attorney general, announces new indictments accusing Murdoch of money laundering as that part of the alleged drug ring. So he's laundering money. Okay, so attempted murder, actual murder, drug trafficking, embezzling, Computer crimes, whatever that computer is. Computer <laughs> crimes, falsifying police reports. Obtaining property obtaining under false property pretenses. Obtaining false pretenses. I, I don't have enough fingers to keep going with these allegations. So the way this worked was, uh, over the course of eight years, Alec wrote at least 437 checks to Curtis Smith, which totaled $2.4 million. What could this man possibly have been doing that would warrant this kind of payday? Yeah. Smith would then allegedly convert the checks to cash in order to facilitate the acquisition or distribution of illegally obtained narcotics, as well as to benefit Murdoch and conceal or disguise the nature, location, sources, ownership, or control of the proceeds from a myriad of unlawful activities. So, yeah, it's a whole lot of stuff. He's just... A myriad, you might say. Would you say it's possibly a, a plethora, plethora He's got a plethora. of charges? Yes, his new total charges are 81 different oh, charges. He keeps going. He can hit 100 before the end of the year. <laughs> On July 13th, 2022, Alec Murdoch is formally disbarred by the South Carolina Supreme Court. So he's no longer a lawyer. What's a tally on the charges? His new charges, 84. Aha. Uh -huh. So he added on a few here in July. How many lawsuits are going on? 11. Nice. <laughs> he's working hard here. So far, all the charges against Alec Murdoch involve financial crimes. But on July 14th, 2022, it's announced that Alec has been indicted on two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime in connection to the June 2021 deaths of his wife and son, Paul. That sounds like a lot more serious than the other charges. Yeah, it took them a long time to finally arrest him. I guess they were like keeping him in jail, busy with all those other charges so they could get the stuff they needed to do to together to arrest him for the murders. Yeah. Two sources close to the investigation say that authorities have cell phone video that they believe not only puts Murdoch at the scene of the slaying shortly before they took place, but also contradicts a previous timeline of events provided on the day of the killings. This is a statement from South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson. All the efforts of our office and the law enforcement agencies involved in this investigation have been focused on seeking justice for the victims' families. We want to thank the State Law Enforcement Division, 
the attorneys and staff in our office and everyone who worked on this case for their tireless efforts to gather evidence and follow where it led. We also want to thank the Culleton County Grand Jury for listening to that evidence and for their service to the people of the state. Murdoch's attorney, Dick Harputlian, and Jim Griffin say in a statement to Fox Carolina that the defendant, quote, wants his family, friends, and everyone to know that he did not have anything to do with the murders of Maggie and Paul. It was very clear from day one that law enforcement and the attorney general prematurely concluded that Alec was responsible for the murder of his wife and son. But we know that Alec did not have any motive whatsoever to murder them. Besides Alec Murdoch and Corey Fleming, another alleged conspirator in the financial crimes is indicted. Russell Lafitte, who was CEO of Palmetto State Bank, was arrested in connection with misappropriating client funds. Lafitte's family founded Palmetto State Bank in Hampton in 1907. So he was doing basically like Alec would go find a client and yeah. Lafitte would act as the conservator because if the person was under age or unable to control their own money, he would be the one to... He's supposed to be conserving the money. So the money is supposed to go into an account and say that the child is 12 and they can't have access, direct access to the money. Well, the child has to come say, I need this, I need that, and get it approved by a judge. And then he gives her the money. Well, he was taking loans from that money for himself and for Alec. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds illegal. It is quite illegal. So on July 20th, 2022, Alec Murdoch enters a not guilty plea in response to the murder charges. On August 19th, there are nine more counts that are added to his charges, so we're now that somewhere... puts over 100, don't it? No, we're in the 90-something range. It's still okay. in the 90. Okay. But there's so many, it's unbelievable, really. Yes, it I would is. love to dig into them, and I've been following this case for a long time, and there's so many families that have been affected by these crimes, and each of their stories deserves to be heard, but for time's sake... We're going to keep this as this overview because there's just so much to go into. Indeed. On October 13th, Alec Murdoch's trial on the two murder charges is set for January 23rd, 2023, and will take place at the Colleton County Courthouse. I bet you there are going to be a lot of people yes, in town it's going to when be that crazy. goes down. This highly anticipated trial is expected to take three weeks, and I've heard it's going to be on the level of O.J. Simpson. Well... I don't know how these things work nowadays. Do they allow just anybody to go in and witness this stuff? Or is it like you have to have tickets to go see it? I don't or is know. It like they it's close probably the doors? a certain amount of people can get in. So, so just you whoever get gets in, in line. first. And then I'm sure there's a certain amount of press that get in and stuff like that. Family. Yeah, family. People that are affected by the mm -hmm. case. Maybe like maybe if somebody had something that had to do with one of the charges that they're talking about, maybe they get to be in there. Yeah. Well, the first trial is just for the two murders. There, okay. It's not any of the other charges that are going well, to be that's addressed probably at the this most point. high profile one yeah. of the charges, yeah. of the 90-something charges. Yeah. To this point, <laughs> to I this haven't point. finished yet. No, he's at 90-something currently. Okay. And I would love to talk about all the drama that's been happening in the past couple of weeks in detail, but this podcast would end up being four or five hours long. So I'm just going to hit a couple of high points of the recent development. Alex co-conspirator Russell Lafitte that I talked about a minute ago. Yes. He has been convicted of all six of his charges. Lafitte was found guilty of conspiracy, wire fraud, bank fraud, as well as guilty of three counts of misapplying bank funds. Okay. So we don't say allegedly about him No, anymore. it is not alleged. He has been convicted in a court of law, and he faces up to 30 years in prison and millions of dollars in fines in connection with those convictions. Oh, no. According to an article I read in FitzNews.com, who, if you're interested in a deep dive into the subject, check out their website. I'll try to put the link up on the screen here somewhere. Yeah, he has a whole section down there. about Murdoch. That he's been covering this case since the beginning and has a ton of info. And also check out the podcast called The Murdoch Murders Podcast with Mandy Matney. She's been on the case since day one and does a terrific job bringing all the relevant content you could ever need. Maybe we could hit her up. Yeah. Hey, do you need somebody to impersonate Southern people's voices? <laughs> she really is the I had a expert lot to this, this yeah. kind of stuff. Hey, you want to hear me say Cherville? Oh, gosh. 
I think she lives in Hilton Head or so. We could probably see her from out there on the beach. Then. Yeah, she's an investigative journalist, and she has a podcast all about the Murdochs, and she goes into detail on every aspect of it. So if you're interested, check her out. Okay. Another recent development is that the prosecution has changed the timeline for the death window. I told you the time frame would be important to recall. And originally it was in between 9 and 9.30, which he has an alibi for. But now they've expanded it from 8.30 to 10.06 when Alex placed that 911 call. This is significant because it could possibly place Alec at Moselle when the crime occurred. Originally, his brother had stated that Alec had taken their father to a hospital in Savannah. But it later came out that the brother, John Marvin, had taken their father. And that Alec was at Moselle at 6 p.m. where he had dinner with Maggie and Paul. He then rode around the property with Paul checking on things. Then he fell asleep on the couch. He woke up around 9 p.m. and left to go check on his mother. His mother had a nurse's aide who said Alec was there from 9 to 9.20 watching game shows. He then returned to Moselle where he found Maggie and Paul shot to death. With that original time being between 9 and 9.30, that would eliminate Alec. But if you expand it back to 8.30, then he's in the window. We don't yet know what evidence the state has to change this time frame. That account of Alec's timeline was given by his attorney, Jim Griffin, on that recent HBO documentary called Low Country, The Murdoch Dynasty. Which you haven't watched yet. I am going to. I just found out about it. So if you want to watch that, it's on HBO Max, and there, it's supposed to be really good. It's supposed to have exclusive footage, like I said, about the mm. uh, hospital and everything. I guess we'll be watching murder shows And tonight. it's just shocking to me that his attorneys would go on and tell their you know, timeline— for him and Who's like this fly by night attorney he's got here. No, these are supposed to be some of the best <laughs> of the best. And like, how would they make such a tactical error? Well, you see what it did. It caused the state to have to rethink the timeline. Or do timeline. we? Or so do, maybe, maybe they're doing they're it on purpose. Really smart, and they know something that we don't know. So all kinds of stuff's been happening, including an alleged uh, plea deal. That's been sent out to him. You know how many him? times alleged has been used just know, on this episode so alone? So there's uh, plea deal talks and also... Probably about as many times as charges as this man has. <laughs> Probably. And uh, his lawyers have filed a 95-page... Thesis like, that they nailed no. to the church in Wittenberg, Germany? No, they've got like all these um, things they're filing with the court, just mm. all kinds of rigmaroles going on. It's just a whole thing. All right. His trial is set for January, and so we'll see if that happens or if they get it postponed. So if you want to learn more, if you want us to do more episodes, let us know. If not, we'll go back and do something else. I mean, we're still going to do the stuff we always done oh yeah we just want to see if perhaps you might have an interest in hearing about more i mean this modern day yeah. type stories involving some true crime yeah. to be true to the nature of our show we're never going to be covering any of these really graphic serial we're killers. not going to do Dahmer or gacy or anything like that but i think this is just one of the most crazy but, things i've ever heard but if there is a and it's local it's local so to us, that yeah. uh, that makes sense but if there is some case that you think would be interesting to hear us cover, feel yeah. free to send us a message on our website. Just go to our website and look at the contact page, and every way you could ever want to get in touch with us <laughs> is listed on that page. He's got a lot of buttons to push on there. I got buttons. Okay, that brings us to the time of the show where we like to... Insert graphic here. Butimus. <laughs> What we're watching. So this week, we started and finished a new show <laughs> In on less than 48 hours. And I had no idea that this show even existed until Crystal told me about it. And one of my friends mentioned it while we were playing that show. We mentioned it at the beginning of the episode on Tybee. And he was like, you got to check this show out. It's great. And so we binged it. Over two days, mm -hmm. like Crystal said, staying up till 3 a.m. each night. Bad idea. And what we are talking about is the 2022 Netflix comedy slash horror show, Wednesday. The premise of this one follows the daughter of Gomez and Morticia Adams, 
of the Adams family fame. Oh, yeah. She's a loner and is super dark and is basically goth, mm. even though it's not really goth. It's more, you know, murderous, <laughs> but just happens to appear as goth. And she, at the opening of the show, goes to a normal school along with her brother Pugsley. He is being bullied by the high school jocks, and she is not happy to find him locked up in his locker, tied up. And I think he had an apple in his mouth like a stuck pig. And he falls out of his locker struggling, and she goes down to assist him to help him up. As she touches him, she has a psychic vision and sees all these people that did this bad bullying to her brother. She then says she'll take care of it because that's what she does. She goes to their practice for water polo or whatever it is that jocks do in a <laughs> pool. That's what, it looked like water yeah. polo to me. I don't know. Or maybe it was just swimming. And she just comes up holding two big bags of piranhas <laughs> and throws them into the pool. And obviously, this creates a huge incident and yeah. scene for her. Attempted murder. So, yeah. Eh, <laughs> just another count. You know? yeah. She's then enrolled by her parents into... Nevermore Academy, a school for outcasts located in Jericho, Vermont. She finds out that this is where her parents were enrolled in school, and she's mad because she wants to find her own way and not follow in her mother's footsteps. Soon after this happens, a mysterious monster appears and people start dying. Then, She is presented by one of the monster's victims a drawing right before he dies, showing her at Nevermore Academy with the school in flames behind her. The victim then says she's destined to destroy the school and all of its students. So then she decides that she has to commence on an investigation to try to find out what this monster is and to try to stop its vicious killing spree and this monster is so cool in a horrific looking way it's very beetlejuice and this makes sense as this show is directed by none other than tim burton so crystal we binge watched all eight episodes over the course of 48 hours we did tell me what is your rating of this show on our arbitrarily chosen scale of one to beetlejuice (laughs) I'll give it an 11. I really liked it. I liked everything. I especially like the costuming and the the whole look of the place. The set was great. I think they filmed it. Where'd you say it? It was filmed in Romania, yeah, I think. Yeah, I love that. Like the, the majority castle of it. and everything. And the story was great. It kept you wanting to finish watching it. Like, we couldn't stop, even at 3 a.m. It's like, no, I want to see what she happens. She made me turn it off the first yeah. night. <laughs> yeah. But the actress that played Wednesday did a great job portraying her. Then you find out that the, in real life the girl's 20 years old. Yeah, she's supposed to be, sure what, 15? Yeah. Because like she turned 16 in the show. Yeah, I guess that's not really that far off. It's not, but she does look very young. She looks young for her age. Yeah, she does look very role. young. But, yeah, she did a great job, like, conveying the way Wednesday is as a character. I thought she did a great job. And it also has Christina Ricci in it. Who played who was Wednesday? The original Wednesday. It's not the original Wednesday for the movies. Yeah, they, from the nineties. There was a show. People back in the our 60s. age didn't watch the show in the sixties. They watched the movies. Oh yeah, Raul Julia and uh, what's Angelica her name? Houston. Angelica Houston yeah. and Christopher Lloyd is Uncle Fester. Yeah, Uncle Fester makes an appearance in this. Spoiler. <laughs> it's yeah, not but, really a spoiler. Yeah. There's, you see. There's some Adams Family stuff happening here, yeah. but this show is truly focused on Wednesday, and there's side characters that make cameos throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was great. I don't and think it detracted from it. I think it's better because then it allows to tell her story and not have to tie it in yeah. to being with the other people. Who it was a dark comedy, but it wasn't super dark. I mean, there's murders, no. but it's not hardly any slasher. cussing. Even there was hardly any language, so I thought it was very. Friend, family friendly as far as these days go. As far as a horror TV show will go. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with my younger kids. I mean, not little, little kids, but if we had young teens. You said the other night, like 10 and up. Or was yeah. that our podcast? No. I don't know. I'd say 10 plus, yeah, because kids see all kinds of stuff these days. And ah, I, they're desensitized. I didn't find anything very offensive in it. Yeah. I don't know. If I was a little kid and I saw that monster, that thing was kind of creepy. 
Yeah, but think about a little kid today. They've seen way worse. I would be terrified. But I was terrified of Medusa and Clash of the yeah. Titans from the old uh, Harry Ham- Hamlin, Hamlin. Hamlin Harry movie. Harry Hamlin. Yeah, I still can't watch that scene. It scares oh, gosh. me. When they lop off her head and yeah. the ketchup comes pouring out of the yeah. claymation. Uh, All right. What is your so rating, 11 uh, dog treats for you. Yeah, 11 for me. What do you Do rate? you beat juice? I give this particular show. I can't give it a 12. I wanted to, but... I it's just not it, perfection. I give it an 11. And the reason I give it an 11 is because there are some s- scenes and stuff that happens. It's kind of telegraphed, and you see it coming. And when you get down near the end, it, in a way, this is sort of, yes, it's a, a comedy horror, but it's also somewhat of a mystery mm-hmm. because you're trying to figure out who this killer is throughout the course of the show. And they lay some fairly obvious red herrings that me and Crystal picked out on, and I figured out who the killer was. So we were three episodes from the end, and I said, I believe this person is the killer. But then you find, as it goes even further, that there's more to it than just that, and you're sort of having to figure out more than one thing going on. And I, we both called... Well, the first part of what happens, I called. Then the second part is sort of floating around where it could be several different angles could be going on. And we both said, it's got to be one of these things happening. And we picked, we sort of picked it right. But it does have a twist ending. And it, I like a twist ending. And it does have a big final confrontation yeah. at the end where, you know, everything comes down and it has to, you know, there's a big clash of somebody and somewhere and something. <laughs> And something Stuff happens. happens. Stuff happens, and then it ends. Yeah, and but, then it ends. But if this show gets canceled after this season, which is highly unlikely, yeah, I think because it's, it's already apparently crashed yeah, so many records. It's going to get renewed. Uh, it. I don't feel like it even needs a second season. I feel like they wrapped up this season in such a way that yeah, it definitely lays the groundwork for a second season. But if it didn't do a second season, this would be fine just being one season long, yeah, and you wouldn't miss story. anything. So our recommendation is to go watch this as fast as possible and binge it because it's a very good TV show. Yeah, stay up all night, kids. All night. It's good for you. (laughs) So that brings us to the portion of the show that we like to call. Layla and coffee and Oscar talk. The good news is, is that I saw Oscar out there this evening. So he is fine and healthy and he's fatter than ever. He's getting big and bloated up. And yeah, after what we're going to call the Oscar incident, we are so glad he's okay. Oh, yes, only our patrons know about the yes, Oscar incident. Yes, uh, we had a very traumatic incident. We went for a walk the other night, as usual. And we were coming back down our street, and there's a house with a fence that kind of juts out a little bit where you could park your car next to it. And Layla kind of took off after something. She was on the leash, but you had a little slack in it. And she took off and pulled you in that direction like she's going after something. And we get over there, and I assumed it was a cat or something that would run away, but it was— It's about this big It was Oscar— and he looked dead. And then I remembered, hey, possum's play dead. And I'm dead. like holding her with all my weight, yeah. pulling her away. And it's just laying there. You can see its eyes open. And yeah. It's just laying there it like looked this. dead. And I'm like, I was like, Layla, Oscar. you killed Oscar. Killed Oscar. Yeah. So luckily, uh, after that, we went and checked when we brought the dogs in and walked back out there. And he was gone. So yeah. he was just pretending. It's so funny. They really look dead when they play dead. So if you've ever wondered, they do. He's fine. He's good. He's all good. He came it's up for really dinner looks tonight. like he played dead. Yeah, so, so that's pretty fun. So if you want to find us online, look for us at scarysavannahandbeyond.com. You can find us on all social media platforms using the username at Scary Savannah. Please tell your friends about our show. Tell a friend that we exist. Let them know what we talk about. Tag them on a social media platform and tag us in it. We'll talk about it on air. We'll even post you on, on our YouTube channel. It'll be all kinds of fun. Everybody will be excited. And it'll be like, Who? <laughs> You know, sort of like what happens to me in real life. So check that out. Also check our merch store. You can find that on our website. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can buy Crystal a coffee by clicking on this little yellow icon on our website in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. 
leave her some coffee. Yeah, because I just got an espresso machine. Got a new espresso machine. So she needs coffee beans to I go in the espresso machine. I do. And if you can do that, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, join our Patreon. We've got exclusive episodes. You can check that out. We release at least one a week. That's patreon.com forward slash scary savannah. And that just leaves those last 15 words that I like to hear you say. So please lay it on me, baby. Join us next time in Savannah, where the ghosts and the good times live on. But do you know who don't? Well, luckily Oscar does. Oscar does he live does on. Live on. It's a happy ending. Yay. I mean, except for the dude we're talking about this episode. Well, but I mean, Alec as long as Oscar's on. okay, you know. <laughs> He's just about to go on trial. Yeah.